I'm here on Smithdown Road at the Handyman we're with Andy. Tell us how this came about because I think for, for most people who are in and around South Liverpool um, and the Smithdown Road area in particular will have driven past this for, for many years, um, disused and now it's this fabulous new venue. <laughs> um, well. Uh, historically, me and my business partners are architects, and we run a sort of small practice in town. And uh, we were involved in sort of designing lots of bars and restaurants over the years. And just as a as a natural progression, um, we got together with a couple of friends who sort of run local bars in the area, and thought we'd like to sort of. Uh, find and develop our own uh, bar and sort of venue and we sort of we sort of looked at numerous places a few on Rose Lane some in the city centre at first and, and got close never quite happened and um, we never really we never really thought we weren't really thinking about Smith Down Road this building in particular and then it just uh, for a friend of ours we heard it might be coming available and um, it was just it just sort of clicked in our head we all remembered being in here as students and stuff and as soon as we walked through the door again we were just like this this would be the you know the perfect space for a bar and brewery so straight away it was just like you know definitely going to happen so what was the the thinking behind keeping the frontage the same uh, oh we just loved it it's absolutely perfect it's such a it's such like a unique building that everyone knows on Smith Down Road it was like some of the other venues we looked at uh, and we were interested in we you know we tried to describe them to people and it was really difficult to um, you know oh it's, you know, it's on this street there or whatever but with the handyman supermarket it was just straight away everyone just knows where it is straight away and it's sort of already a iconic landmark of, um, of Smith Down Road so we thought it would be really shame to chase it I mean we like everything about it we like the colours the horse's head even the old keys cut sign and things like that we'll be hearing all about how the handyman brew their very own beer right here on Smith Down Road so don't go anywhere from juggling to ribbon dancing, Liverpool One has brought the big tops to the city centre with free circus workshops up until the 2nd of September that the family won't want to miss. Just tell us how the free circus workshops came about. Um, yeah, um, so this year marks the 250th anniversary of the circus. Um, so Liverpool One really wanted to celebrate that with style. Um, and given The Greatest Showman is such a big film and something that um, people of all ages seem to really um, love this year, um, we thought it was a great way to celebrate summer and to give families something free to do um, in amongst all the other options they've got this summer. And what makes it such an attraction for the kids and for the family to come down to spend their summer vacation? Um, so we've got a range of free workshops right throughout the summer, so from 12 till 4 daily, even across the weekend. And um, there's great skills like juggling, Diablo, and um, from real experts who do this every day. So it's a real special treat to be able to see the circus experts show off their skills and then try a little bit of it yourself. And it seems like perfectly ideal because a lot of kids in this generation like to stay indoors and be on social media and play on video games. I think it's important to get them out and do something active and productive. Yes, yeah, certainly. And we've got a long line in history of whether it's sports, equipment up on the park or it's activities like today. It's full of kind of big open spaces where kids can run around, have fun and play, whether they're running up um, the green steps that we've got down by John Lewis or they're running across Shabazz Park or they're here at the workshops and um, getting kids out and active and enjoying time with their family this summer is something that's really important to us. What reaction have you been getting from the kids and the families that have been coming down to the workshops? Everybody seems to really enjoy it. People are asking what, how long is it here for, when can I come back? Um, so they say it's on every day throughout the summer holidays, 12 till 4, um, weekends included. So do come down. If you come and tried something, there could be something a bit different another day. So do keep coming and trying down all the different um, activities that we've got on offer. Make sure to stay tuned as there's plenty more to come from the Big Top on Merseyside Live. With 10 of China's most acclaimed contemporary artists showcasing their work on the Liverpool waterfront this summer as part of the This Is Shanghai exhibit, we've headed to the Cunard building to find out what makes the special relationship between Liverpool and Shanghai. So could you just tell us what the This Is Shanghai exhibit is all about? Absolutely. So um, this year, while the Terracotta Warriors are in Liverpool, we're running a season called China Dream. And China Dream is a nine-month-long season where we're celebrating the best of contemporary Chinese culture. And This Is Shanghai is part of the China Dream season. It's basically a celebration of some of the best new and emerging artists coming out of Shanghai. And the reason we've chosen to host it here on the waterfront in the Cunard building is the similarities between the waterfront in Liverpool, the Three Graces, and the Bund in Shanghai the waterfront in Shanghai. So what would you say would be some of the strongest similarities between the two cities considering on opposite, opposite sides of the globe? Well, it's amazing that as waterfront cities, they share a lot of DNA. You know, there's a real cultural melting pot that takes place in those cities. And I think what is absolutely 
uh, uh, at the core of those similarities is about creative ideas, development and ambition. And actually, that's something we're trying to really sell in in this exhibition and showcase. Clearly, they are totally poles apart in terms of what they look and feel like when you actually arrive in those cities, very different. But actually, there's a real similarity. If you walk down the bun in Shanghai, it looks a bit like Liverpool and it feels like Liverpool in terms of the energy. And I think that's something that we really want to try and get across and why we were so committed to using the waterfront here and reflecting as much as we could the kind of architecture and also spirit of Shanghai. I think there are actually a lot of similarities, especially they are brought together by art itself. For example, you can see like within this exhibition, um, like Chinese artists try to give their own perspectives of the both like Shanghai as well as Liverpool. But at the same time, you can see lots of similarities. Make sure to stay tuned as late in the show, we'll be getting a closer look at one of This Is Shanghai's more elaborate and unique art pieces. We're upstairs, this isn't generally open to the public, but it's where they brew their very own beer, which you can sample here if you like. But we're just hearing about the process that goes into making beer, so do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, so uh, here at the Handyman we've got a 400 litre brew kit and uh, the beer is made in a, a sort of four stage process. This uh, larger, largest vessel is called the uh, hot liquor tank, which is uh, basically a really large kettle that just, that just uh, heats the water up to a suitable temperature to start the brewing process. So once, once this has been on for about a day or so heating up, uh, the water is transferred into the mash tun, um, which is where it's mixed with uh, malts and various other ingredients to make the base wart for the brew. So after that, and that, that sort of gives the brew its base flavour and its sort of uh, alcohol content in, in many ways. Um, so after that's been mashed up, turned around, the water's been sent through it a few times, um, the, the uh, wart passes into the copper which again is like another big kettle which just boils that water but during that process um, hops are added which gives the beer its flavour and it sort of smells its flavours it just makes makes the beer nice effectively and then the final stage in the process is then the the beer is then transferred into the fermenters where it will then you know sit at various temperatures between between a week and two weeks depending on what we're brewing um, and uh, during that point the uh, the final ingredients are added are the, are the yeast and then some final hops to give for specific beers give different flavoring um, and it spends the, the time in which the time at which the hops are added during the process uh, um, gives different flavors to the beer so whether it's so the initial taste or the aftertaste or um, has different effects so don't go anywhere because we'll be hearing more about the handyman on smith town a little bit later we're still here on Egbeth Road. We are now in the grocery shop next door to the bread shop with a whole variety of interesting stuff around us. So you've evolved quite a lot of the business, haven't you? Yeah, I think obviously people's tastes and change have, have dramatically changed. I think uh, curry now is the British's favourite meal. Obviously 20 years ago that, that wasn't um, the case. Uh, we have products have changed here. What we're trying to do is support other local independents as well, and that re reflects in the business uh, and the products that are around. And like we were talking about next door, where you've got stuff like your your pheasant, and you've got things like that. But then you've also got a lot of vegan, veggie. You've got a lot of health food stuff, especially in here. Yeah, I think obviously um, with the sugar tax and with. Um, people's general healthier eating. We're selling a lot more fruit and veg, we're selling a lot more um, vegan food. Uh, I think people are watching a little bit what they're eating, what they're drinking, uh, what they're consuming. Um, and that's great, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's different, it's exciting, it's a bit more fun than, than selling the same food. So like, yeah, we have jackfruit behind you, we have um, vegan lime curd. Um, yeah, it's great. It is, isn't it? Uh, but we've got also got a whole selection of American sodas as well, if we don't want to be so good as well. Yeah, I think everyone needs a treat night now and again, don't they? And it's getting up to you know the weekend, I think we all need a treat. So, um, yeah, uh, why not, you know? We, we just try to cater for everyone, really, and everyone's um, continual changing of taste, I suppose. Exactly, and, and how have you found the support from the local community? Oh, do you know, we're not... We're not here for 60 years by fluke, really. I mean, obviously, the, the people of Egbeth have been fantastic to support us for 60 years, um, and, and I hope that continues, really. Uh, it is hard in our days. There's Tesco's online deliveries. There's um, huge supermarkets. But, you know, we're still here, and we're still doing really well. So, yeah, I hope I can pass the, the business on to my kids one day.
As the old saying goes, if you build it, they will come. And here in Williamson Square, the local community is banded together to take part in Lost Castles, where bygone architecture of the past is brought to life with humble cardboard and tape. Why was this uh, project so important to bring to the city? Well, I think that the cultural strategy was talking about how do we shine the light on all of the history and heritage and the culture in all of the boroughs, as well as obviously in the city, which we're very proud of. But it's really important to spread, spread it out into the boroughs. So when we had the chance to work on Lost Castles, it's a really good way of um, having a, a, an overarching brand which is dead exciting isn't it Lost Castles but actually each borough being able to turn that into something that is very specific for their local area with their own communities behind it and their own cultural sector and it's really helped us to engage far more people in something like this it's a, crazy and also got everybody working together across the city region in a way that we haven't really done in this way before not only for staff working together but all the funders coming together and the Metro Mayor supporting it and the city and the boroughs and the Arts Council so it's just been a really exciting project and one we hope we can repeat in another year maybe. Yeah I mean absolutely looking around everyone seems so excited and getting involved was that part of the plan to get the local communities involved with the project? Absolutely it's all about the communities this wouldn't ha none of this would happen if, the, if people hadn't been involved so far so throughout the last week in all the workshops around the boroughs there have been people turning up sometimes every single day sometimes with their kids sometimes in their suits in the middle of the day from work so people have been creating what you see around you and um, they've all and it's been really interesting to see people work quite closely on a very specific piece of cardboard infrastructure so by by tomorrow afternoon they'll all be up all six of them and then they'll be up all day Saturday and then they'll be up part of the day Sunday and then in rotation they'll all start to come down on Sunday because they're cardboard so they can't stay up forever even though we might want them to. Hello welcome to Merseyside Live I'm Alice Jones and here are today's headlines. Merseyside police are appealing for information following a road traffic collision that resulted in serious injury in clock face St Helens on Sunday evening. At around 5.35 p.m. a call was received of a collision in Greenwood Court involving a suspected stolen Yamaha Phaser motorbike which had reportedly collided with a wall. The rider, a man in his 20s, was taken to hospital with what are described as critical head injuries. The bike was then moved from its location to Burnage Road and Chief Inspector Gary O'Rourke has stated that it would appear that two men moved the bike following the incident, potentially abandoning a seriously injured person in order to hinder the investigation. A woman from Toxteth has been charged with firearms offences after a shotgun and ammunition were recovered following an execution of a warrant at an address on Upper Warwick Street. Officers executed the warrant at the property shortly after 9pm on Sunday 19th of August. Hannah Allen 40 years old has been charged with possession of a shotgun and possession of ammunition. Liverpool has one of the highest mortality rates for lung cancer in the UK. In a bid to combat this, a project in Liverpool is providing a lifeline for potential lung cancer sufferers by offering lung MOTs and has been able to detect early signs of disease in 40 patients. The checks at GP surgeries are for anyone who has ever smoked between the ages of 68 to 75. And finally, some peak time train fares for commuters travelling to and from Manchester have doubled following recent timetable changes. Following a review of the pricing of fares for journeys from Liverpool to Manchester, passengers are now faced with having to pay double what they were previously. TPE's James Cohen has said that the changes represent a significant reorganisation of the TPE network, including our seating capacity, journey times and the direct journey opportunities open to customers. That is all your headlines for now, but do stay tuned as there is plenty more to come on Merseyside Live. For today's Friendly Face, we've headed down to the beautiful Royal Albert Dock at the Lever Satchel Company to speak to one of Liverpool's most friendliest faces. So you just walk us through what a, a regular day looks like for you. Uh, well, in the dock, we make a lot of bespoke uh, work here, just like this, a lot of hand stitching, and also we, um, we serve customers, walk them through the history of the company, and if they need any customization bags, we can walk them through that and this is like a little workshop area but that's a fantastic view what's it like looking out at the Albert Dock every single day well I think it's nice to walk into and especially every time I open the door it's just a, a waft of leather so it's a nice it's a nice smell and uh, view uh, to walk into and all the um, the customers really like it as well the fact that we're in such a an amazing uh, venue you know like um, scene in, in Liverpool especially you know especially with the tourists as well if you'd like to suggest someone please get in contact with us on social media Media, either via Facebook or on Twitter at Elpool Local TV. 
Hello, I'm Joe McFarlane, and I'm here with today's Good Lines, a roundup of all that's good in the city. Charlie XCX took a break from a worldwide tour with Taylor Swift and Camilla Cabello to pay a visit to the Tate Liverpool for a look at the Life in Motion exhibit by Egon Scheele and Francesca Woodman. Her trip to the Tate exhibition inspired her to reach out to women she knows and ask them to take part in a wider digital conversation about their bodies and body image. Life in Motion remains on display at the Tate, so if you'd like to know more about the message being portrayed throughout the exhibit, then be sure to head down. Daphne's Cheesecake Factory is celebrating 43 years of success in Liverpool. From humble beginnings, the Cheesecake Factory has proved very popular throughout the community for over four decades. We've been down to pay a visit to creator Anne to discuss how she became involved in the cheesecake industry, and you can find out a bit more about that later on. Liverpool International Music Festival is back at Sefton Park this weekend for another unforgettable music experience. On the 21st to 22nd of July, the stage will be set once again to showcase a diverse set of global household names alongside a plethora of emerging new talent that we became known renowned for. Lymph have now released their site plan for the festival, so do make sure to check out that before the celebrations begin, maximising safety and fun. And finally, Merseyside Police are teaming up with Get On to give free motorcycle introductions for over 16s in Birkenhead and Bootle. Anyone aged 16 or over can try a motorcycle for free, courtesy of Get On, the motorcycle industry's tryout programme, and Merseyside Police. Two events are planned which will offer anyone interested the chance to get on two wheels under the introduction of professional qualified instructors. That's all from me for now, but do stay tuned as there's plenty more to come on Merseyside Live. We're down at the Albert Dock. We've come to check out Adventure on the Dock, which during this incredibly hot weather has been a bit of a lifesaver for some people. So I'm going to give those obstacles a go and hopefully cool down in the process. see me enjoying adventure on the dock it was quite something I would definitely recommend it but now we're going to find out what makes this attraction so special and what are some of the things you need people to know maybe before they come down here okay so uh, basic things so just make sure you bring your swimming cosy and a towel with you um, if you can bring your own padlock that's incredible we've got some lockers to use but want to make sure your stuff's safe other than that as long as you guys can swim and you're over the age of eight you can come and have fun with us down at adventure dock it's, it's so it's absolutely incredible you know you're gonna get wet it's a good laugh and um, just want to jump off things go splash and have a good time messing around with your mates have you had many head-to-heads? Are there people who go on like time trials against each other? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our staff in particular, we've got a bit of a leaderboard in the staff room going. Uh, someone in particular is winning. I'm not going to mention who because his, his uh, head's big already. Uh, but no, every week the staff are on there having time trials. Um, some of our private hires, we've absolutely done time trials with some of them. We've got a couple of charity events coming up in September in which we're going to make sure they do some awesome time trials and uh, uh, relay races with teams and things like that. It's an incredible way to use it. A hundred years on from the armistice, which ended World War I, one of the bloodiest and most horrific wars in human history, we've headed down to St George's Hall for the Royal Legion's Thank You 100 display, which honours our British heroes. Could you just tell us how this display came about? Well, a hundred years ago, uh, World War I came to an end and the world that we live in changed forever. Um, and the world that, we, that, that was left behind, uh, we experienced so many of the benefits of that world. So women got the votes, tea bags were invented, chocolate bars were developed, x-rays were developed and the Royal British Legion really wanted to say thank you to the generation who fought for all of those things, both for those who served abroad and fought in the war but also women and children and men who stayed in this country and kept the country going during that very difficult time. So it's the Royal British Legion and we hope the public saying thank you to that generation. Could you just tell us what your personal connection is to World War One and Two? Yes, my father 
uh, served in both world wars. He went to France in the First World War, age 16. Uh, I always thought he was 15, but he was 16 apparently. And his biggest fear, he always told us, was the boat sinking when he went across, not getting a shot, but sinking when he went across because he couldn't swim. And that was his only concern, which was rather surprising for us. So he fought in both wars, is that correct? Well, yes, he fought in the First World War. He was in the Somme. Uh, he was too old in the Second World War, but he volunteered, and he was based in the Orkney Islands with the Royal Artillery Searchlight Detachment. So it sounds like your father sacrificed an awful lot for his nation. So do you think it's very important that a display like this is being shown all over the country so people can pay their respects? Yes, absolutely, because they gave so much to give us what we've got today. Make sure to stay tuned to Merseyside Live as later in the show we'll be learning what part St George's Hall played in World War I. Now this is the city's 19th year of celebration, commemoration and remembrance to mark Slavery Remembrance Day. Liverpool was the European capital of the transatlantic slave trade responsible for half of Britain's trade. More than 5,000 slaver ship voyages were made from the city. Ships were departing from Liverpool were going to carry an estimated one and a half million enslaved Africans into slavery. For the first year ever, there's a theme to the programme of celebration, commemoration and remembrance that is growth. We've been at the public libation an ancient spiritual ceremony involving an offering to commemorate and pay tribute to those affected by slavery what's your involvement in this uh, just from the community perspectives you know uh, i've been involved from the uh, well literally from the start and um, as a member of liverpool community i just do my bit to make it uh, a good day fabulous so tell us why it's so important to mark this day of remembrance well, it's important to mark this day. Well, first, the date has been set aside and agreed by the United Nations that it should be used to celebrate and remember the uh, atrocity of enslavement, you know, for all those years. So, yeah, it is important to remember this day. There's still a lot of reminders of the slave trade around the city. You know, we've got Penny Lane, for example. Do you think it's important that we keep those names there so that we don't forget rather than change it and erase history? Uh, some will say change, some will say keep them. You know, history can never be modernized anyway. So if you keep it there, at least people will see it as a remembrance. As long as it's used positively, then it's, you know, I've got, you know, I don't have any issue with it, whether it's, it's kept or not. And how can you see it changing in the years to come? Can you see it getting bigger, better? What do you think? Well, I hope so. I hope it gets bigger. But obviously, that is, you know, that, that is down to the transition from the older generation to the younger generation so that they can keep it going. But I think it'll get bigger. It'll get bigger. Is there anyone back home or here in Liverpool you'd like to say hello to? Um, yeah, I, have, uh, I live in a very small place called uh, County Fermanagh. It's county in Northern Ireland. Um, but yeah, I'd like to say hello to my mum and dad and my sisters and brothers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> You're from Colchester, is that correct? What brought you to Liverpool here today? Oh, it's a family visit, but come see me all the folks and that, yeah. yeah. Um, what are you going to get up to? Oh, we just bit, bit of shopping today and then we'll back down tomorrow, the old M6 route back, yeah, not looking forward to that, yeah. Oh. Is it your first time in Liverpool or have you been here before? Oh, many times, yeah, I used to live here, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anyone you'd like to say hello to or any family occasions coming up at all? Ah. Oh, well, um, to my mom, um, who's at home, Vaughn Clark, and my husband, DJ, and my son, Caius. Yes, um, and everyone else who is, is a Bermudian here in, in Liverpool. So we've headed down to the Jacaranda Phase 1 bar to speak to today's Friendly Face, a segment where we speak to the friendliest faces of Liverpool. How long have you worked here and what do you enjoy so much about it? Uh, I started working here when we first opened, so I've been here uh, the whole time. and. Yeah, I just think it's a really good mixture of everything I love. Uh, vinyls, coffee, uh, beer and gigs. Yeah, it's perfect. Being a musician myself, I, yeah, it's just a perfect job for me, really. Yeah, so what do you play? Um, I just have a solo project, so I'm a songwriter and, and singer and guitarist, so yeah. Do you ever play here? Yeah, I've actually played here a few times and I'm playing, uh, I'm playing on, I think it's Saturday as well on the stage. Well, that was our friendly face for today. If you'd like to suggest someone to be our friendly face, you can get in contact with us on social media, either via Facebook or on Twitter at Elpool Local TV. You join me now on Penny Lane. We've come to have a chat with the cast and crew members of Our Eddie. My name's Johnny Hurst. I am the, the writer-director of Our Eddie. 
Um, I also give myself a little part playing Tony, uh, the main character's son. It's 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 obviously uh, a career, an acting career that I've had been doing over the last 20 years, and um, and this is a different direction. This is like my own script, and taking on a new challenge in in that journey, really, of um, in the creative arts, really. Yeah. So, what made you want to go forward with the writing side of things instead of just performing? Well, I think I've always I've always wrote um, like other things like playing music, but that's something you don't I don't shout about. It's just a kind of personal kind of expression um, to, to, that I do personally. Why? Because it's, it's that creative challenge, isn't it? About taking on a new leap of faith in your life. I mean, I mean, direct directing a, a film was something I always wanted to do. And why not? Why not? Uh, if you if you you've got the experience of working on set and why not have a go yourself and so all that really writing and directing it's all that kind of a challenge in myself really yeah it's a nice family script I, uh, I sort of looked at myself I've done the same as I already I've, I've worked all my life I've never been on the dole my kids have grown up moved away got their big houses and I'm still stuck in a little three bedroom terrace you know Basically, that was it. Yeah. Uh, so, do you feel like you can empathise with our Eddie a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, all Eddie wanted to do was a quick pint and uh, a flutter on the horses. Although I don't flutter on the horses. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got plenty more coming up from the cast and crew of our Eddie later on in the show. I'm here at Kennehan Books in the Blue Coat to find out all about their fabulous selection of reads. So you've been going for some 34 years, is that right? 34 years, yeah. It's um, been a, a journey we weren't expecting. Uh, we thought we would do it for a year or two before uh, we went on to something else. And we've stayed with it and it's been great. So from the Himalayas to Southport to Liverpool? Yes, from, from the heights of the Himalayas uh, down to level land of Southport, uh, which was a great town for us. For for uh, 28 years we had a shop there um, and we've now been here in the centre of Liverpool for just coming up six years. Oh, what, do you, what do you credit your longevity to? Uh, good fortune. Um, I worked for a year as uh, as an assistant to, to a chap in Belfast where I grew up, um, uh, just helping him and I guess that became my foundation without me realising it. Because right now we're stood in front of a whole wall of books and they're all about Liverpool and the surrounding areas. Most of the things, yeah, most of the things here are, are Liverpool or roundabout. Uh, some of them come from the period um, when it might refer to Lancashire, uh, but it would be essentially about Liverpool because it was driven by Liverpool people and Liverpool money, yeah. And, you know, the, the wide variety of books here, it's all about the history. Um, we can learn a lot about ourselves, I suppose, from looking at the past. There's illustrations of buildings that don't exist anymore. And Yes, indeed. Um, some Sometimes I think uh, we look at new architecture and we say uh, that's nothing by comparison to what was in the past, but what we forget is what we see uh, of all buildings now is only those that survived. Um, so Liverpool, I think, represents a lot of that as well, of uh, the old together with the new and the tomorrow is important too. So don't go anywhere because I'll still be here in the Blue Coat to find out more about the history surrounding this shop. We've just been witnessing the libation ceremony. That's right. It's one that's very close to Liverpool. Slavery remembrance, obviously, this is the internationally recognised day, right. but uh, it's especially important to the city of Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah, well, in many respects, you know, Liverpool leads the way in the UK. Uh, it's not technically the national event, but you know, by all intents and purposes, it's been going the longest, 19th year now. Uh, so a lot of the people involved, Chief Angus Chukameka, who obviously takes the libation, he's been here since the beginning, and I've you know, seen a good 12 myself. So there's events in London now. I think there's some today, and we, we speak to people uh, who are doing that. But yes, we do lead the way, and we're very proud to do that. Very important. One of the most important days in the calendar if not the most important day for this city absolutely because Liverpool is a city built on the slave trade of course I mean who who doesn't know now 
that you know from 1750s to 1807 and people might not know all the technical information but they know that a lot of the built environment is as it is because of the wealth that was that was kind of gained by merchants ship owners who were involved in the transatlantic slave trade of course there was other reasons why liverpool became a wealthy city but at, at its heart was its its role and its involvement in that it, it's all very strategic and deliberate as well you know we're amused like i said we're, we're the leading museum in the world on this but we've got a lot of work to do with some of our parts the reason why we're a successful museum is because the people who are here today support the museum members of the black community in liverpool if they didn't feel as if that we were worth supporting then we've 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 failed so it's about friendships it's about trust uh, so you know but, but we're here on the shoulders of our ancestors you know that was where you know the work and the the difficulties and the real kind of struggle uh, took place so we are hopefully doing something that, that they think is worthwhile well, I'm here at Fowled Fish Bar in Southport, where this fish and chip shop has been nominated as one of the best fish and chip shops in the country. But we're about to go inside and speak to the owners about what separates their fish and chips from any other in the country. Uh, could I just get a bit, of, a bit of background on the business? Yeah, um, I'm myself, I'm a third generation fish fryer. So my family have been doing it since the um, 1960s. And I set up this shop in, uh, was it nine years ago? It's nine years ago in October. Um, yeah, and we basically started off with a small team of um, eight people. Uh, we have three branches now. We have a team of, is it nearly 80 staff now? Yeah, nearly 80. We opened our second shop in 2015, and then we've only just recently opened our third one, so we have 80 staff now. And what is it, well, what's the secret behind your fish and chips here and all your other food that you serve here that, again, makes it stand out from any other fish and chip restaurant? There's no secrets, just don't cut corners, buy the best quality products and um, just do it as, as, as good as you can every time. As I say, we've got MSC certification as well, which a lot, not a lot of shops have got. I think, I think it's 100 now, maybe just over. So that's important about the traceability of the fish, which I think um, you'll see, like, we have a board down the other end that tells the customers, and I think a lot of customers appreciate that. It's a big thing now. Where is it that you, that you source your, you know, your fish? From the sea. Oh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> They're all locally? Um, yeah, we generally work with local uh, suppliers and to get the best quality. It depends on the time of year as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, we, you know, we go to our local green grocers and a lot of local, we want to support local businesses, but we also care a lot about charities as well, so we do a lot of charity work every year. Make sure you stay tuned here to Merseyside Live because there'll be more coming up, but for now, I think we're going to tuck into this. It's GCSE results day, so we've come down to the City of Liverpool College to talk to the staff and students about this very important day. So how have you done today? Um, I've come out with two sevens and a six, which is over what I needed to get into university, so very happy, all sorted. So I did biology, physics and English language and got a seven in bio, a seven in physics and a six in English language, so happy overall. So. Brilliant, congratulations. So where do you see yourself going forward? Well, these are what I needed to get into to university to go and study veterinary science so that makes it even more exciting because I don't go on to A levels from this I'm going straight on to university so I will be packing and moving tomorrow so it should be exciting so I'm nervous but really looking forward to it. I've done great passed all my exams done exactly what I thought it would be and it's allowed me to carry on to do what I want to next year so can't really argue with much. And what is it that you're going ahead to do next year? Doing a biochemistry course at the college that's joint with a, a cleaning company where you test um, cleaning products, also as well as doing your level three extended qualification. So you get to test how well cleaning products react to the skin and whether if you use it for like washing up liquid, it might affect people who are sensitive to and stuff like that. I got a five in English. That's what I had to reset for the third year. So I've passed it now and I'm just like in a really good mood because I was opening it in front of like a, a, another radio company and it was really scary because I thought this is live and there's no going back from opening it so I'm opening it and I seen five I was like oh I've passed and I'm just really chuffed now. And how have the past few months been for you leading up to this moment? It's stressful like over the last couple of weeks I've tried to put it to the back of my mind and not worry but then when I seen the envelope in the teacher's hand I was like all right it's about to happen now but uh I'm just glad it's over and I don't have to sit through more English lessons. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got more from Results Day here at the City of Liverpool College on Merseyside Live. 
So we're back here at the Liverpool waterfront to have a look at one of this is Shanghai's most standout pieces, which represents how the East meets the West. So could you just tell me what your role was in terms of bringing this is Shanghai to life? Uh, well, I was working with Culture Liverpool and collectively we worked out how we might work with China, bringing some of the most ambitious artists from China to the UK. And you probably know that now China is only second to New York in terms of the contemporary art world. And we were really keen to look at bringing that work to Liverpool because it's very exciting, as you can see from behind, and they are incredibly too ambitious sometimes. Um, so what we did is we, we looked at various artists that we could work with. Um, we talked to them. We had a great curator, Xiang Zhihong, who is Chinese. And he worked for us in China to develop the links. And they all came over and they loved the show. All of the artists loved the way that we'd produced it. And some of those artists are showing in the most major biennial exhibitions internationally, but they all wanted to work with Liverpool because they understand the relationship with Shanghai. The piece behind us, um, though static at the moment, it has got like an immersive multi-layered aspect to it with the Tai Chi happening on top. Do you think this is going to be something that's going to bring people in and make it very immersive, especially in a wide open space like this? You should see, so from when we put this up, the number of people who are coming to take selfies in front of Stonehenge is just remarkable. And I think a lot of Xu Zhen is about East meets West. He's interested in our traditions and our ancient traditions and Chinese ancient traditions coming together. So here we've got Stonehenge, which is all a bit mystical and we don't really understand where it came from. And on top of it, you've someone doing sort of a Tai Chi, Kung Fu kind of mix of movements. So that East meets West thing which he has, which I think works so well in the West as well as in China. We've come down to the Titanic Hotel to have a chat with the cast of Titanic the Musical, which is currently being shown at the Empire Theatre here in Liverpool. Uh, five years ago in London, a uh, the, the, the production was put together at the Southwark Playhouse and I was asked to play this role the chairman of the White Star Line, owner of the Titanic, and um, I had the ability to grow facial hair, so I got the role. That's how I got the role. <laughs> and what made you go for that musical in particular? Did the idea interest you that it was such a famous film and now that it was being adapted into a musical? Uh, if I may, with great respect and politeness, correct you on that, because in fact the musical was produced on Broadway about six months before the film came out. Uh, in the 90s, there was a big titanic awareness because at the end of the 80s, the technology had been invented to get down deep enough to investigate the wreck. So by the time the 90s came, there was a huge, massive interest in Titanic. And it just so happened that the creators of the musical and the creators of the film were working together at the same time, but the musical came out first. Uh, a lot of the characters in it are real people. Most of the people in the musical are real. Uh, 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 and if they're not, they're sort of adapted or then they're, they're an amalgam of two two characters. We opened last night, we're only here for a week, and the response last night was fantastic, but I have to say that w everywhere we play it, at the end, what, what, whatever rainy Wednesday afternoon it might be, up in Belfast slash Birmingham slash Southampton, or wherever we've been across the country, the reaction is always the same. People are really vocal in, at the end, and people stand and and uh, we've been at the theatre, people don't stand in our theatre and they do for us. It's, it's very, very powerful. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got plenty more coming up here on Merseyside Live. With the circus celebrating its 250th anniversary, Liverpool One are offering free circus workshops for the kids over summer so they can learn new skills and techniques. So could you just tell us how you got into being a circus performer and someone who goes around? Did you go around the country with these workshops? Um, no, not at the moment. Um, I started doing a four-week lesson with Bring the Fire Project and I just never looked back. I just love it and, and now I work for them. So, yeah, I just absolutely love doing the workshop. I especially love working with the children as well because I'm a nursery assistant full-time. So I'm used to working with lots of children, lots of challenging children as well. So it's good fun and the kids love it. So. Can you just give us a breakdown of some of the workshops that the children can expect to do here? Um, well, we've got juggling, uh, we've been spinning plates, we've been doing ribbons, 
and um, we've been doing poi and using our staff as well which is the big long stick that they spin around. Do you think the kids are getting like different skills and techniques from it? Yeah it's brilliant for their coordination skills. Um, I had a little boy yesterday who um, struggles with his coordination and stuff so I, I spotted him straight away and helped him a little bit with that. We, we use like visual aids really for the children so we say like this is a tornado and this is the snake and then we say a lasso so this could be the lasso and it just helps them to visualize what it should look like so it's quite good and then like this is it a tunnel and we get them to jump through the tunnel as well so yeah it's it, if you describe something to something as something familiar then they automatically just do it it's really good <laughs> I used to be really shy until I started um, with the Fire Project and it's really boosted me confidence and, you know, just have a go and you never know, you know, I, nobody can just juggle straight away, you've got to practice and, and it does, it, it's just really good for your confidence and it's good exercise as well. And so we're going to take a look at some of the books that people can purchase if they would like to. Um, there's some really interesting things here. There was a guy called Louis Giraud, who, uh, very French, but lived in London, and he brought about this series called Bucano. These were all pop-up books, uh, and so uh, it's fairly straightforward when you start inside, but as you get along a bit further, you reveal these layered models uh, that pop up. You know, they were intended to uh, amuse and delight. Never were they expected to survive. You know, so only a, either a home that was incredibly careful, only can look at it on a Sunday afternoon, or uh, possibly uh, just never seen. They've got put on a shelf and, and forgotten. This is uh, Charles Dickens, um, and it, it's a bit of a curious combination, this, but uh, one of his well-known tales, Barnaby Rudge, before it was issued as a novel, it came out in magazine format. And unusual for the time, uh, and unusual right up until me, nearly the end of the 20th century, there were illustrations in the midst of the text. Um, for a while, we took novels far too seriously and uh, uh, no, you should never have pictures in it. That would be childish, wouldn't it? You know, they didn't, didn't like that sort of thing. So, so here it is, uh, pre-first edition uh, of Barnaby Rudge in a rather nice period binding. Just tell us about the other varieties of books that you can get here. Oh, um, all sorts. Uh, so from uh, flick books where you flick through and the image is like a minor film. Uh, sometimes get those, they're great fun. Uh, atlases uh, with maps from 1700s, 1800s. Here we've got uh, Penguin, um, mainly much earlier Penguins, and uh, people my vintage and beyond, uh, they're, they're also still fond of. If you can get the writer you want, there it is. It's a very handy format. Penguin, great job. I'm at the Great Brick Adventure at the Exhibition Centre here in Liverpool. It's got interactive zones, animals, mythical beasts, and much more. There's, there's all kinds of areas, there's all kinds of things going on. Uh, just tell us how, how it all began. Um, well, our company's been creating Lego models for nearly 10 years now. Um, we started to do some Lego shows, so we've got various touring shows. Um, here this weekend we've got Lego Safari um, and Mythical Beasts. So Safari is animals from all around the world. There's uh, 80 different models of animals. And Mythical Beasts is creatures from heroes and legends, so you minotaurs, hydras, cyclops, that sort of thing. Um, We've combined that with interactive elements like our warrior bots where you can actually fight with fighting robots a bit like Robot Wars. Um, we've got Feed the Frogs where you can try and launch bricks into the mouths of frogs. Uh, huge brick pits where you can come along and build your own models in thousands and thousands of bricks. Uh, various selfie zones where you can sit in or next to models and actually get your picture taken being a racing car driver or an air, a fighter pilot, various things like that. Uh, and, and then there's retailers and we've got Clatterbridge Cancer Hospital where you can come and help build a, a model of the new cancer hospital that's being built in Liverpool. So lots and lots to see and do. So Linus the Lion, for example, I mean, he must have taken a pretty long time to be built. Um, yeah, a model like this will take about a month to build with a team of about three LEGO builders uh, and that's after we've designed it. So first of all, we'll take a sort of digital 3D model, then we'll run it through some software, then we'll colour it in uh, and then the builders will set to on building it. Uh, it actually has a steel framework inside for when we transport them because obviously shipping these big models, the elephant itself weighs 1.2 tonnes. So it's not the sort of thing that you can just move around by hand and hope it doesn't break. So we have to put steel frameworks inside them to keep them safe when we transport them around. Don't go anywhere because we've got much more on the Great Brick Adventure a little bit later on. 
OK, Mary, so can you tell us a bit about how you got involved with Already? Well, I was on a film set uh, with Johnny, Johnny Hurst, and we had good fun on that. And it was quite successful, the film, actually. It went to uh, America, but it done quite well. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a call from Johnny. Um, he asked me if I'd read the script and would I like to be a part of the film? And I jumped at the chance. So Stan, tell us a bit about how you got involved with Already. Well, funny enough, I, uh, I got a phone call from this fella, John, never met him before in my life, and he says he's putting a film on Liverpool, a very low budget film, there's no money. So I uh, put the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I heard about him, that he was doing this film in Liverpool. So uh, obviously I'm from Liverpool, live in Liverpool. So uh, I live on Merseyside. And uh, I think, you know, anybody who's trying to do something, you know, like this, and I've had a go myself, and it's, uh, it's how complicated it is, and you need all the help you can get. So I was on board right from the start. Johnny uh, inboxed me on uh, Facebook, that's how it came about, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a film. So I said to him, maybe, I, I never commit to anything through a, you know, a message. I said, send me the script first. So he sent me the script, I read it, liked it, loved it, and then uh, I agreed to do it, you know? Simple, that's all it took. July 2016, I worked with a short film with Johnny, the writer-director, where he's the um, main actor in the film. And then when we finished that film, we kind of kept in touch, and then he messaged me, sent, sent across this 10-page script, which was called Shock at the time. And he said, what, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on it? So I gave my thoughts, and um, then he messaged me back saying, would you like to get involved in it? So we did, we got involved in it, and then a 10-page script turned out to be a 45-page script in the end. We're still here at the Royal Albert Dock at Lunyalita. We've been talking to Peter to find out what makes this family-run business so special. We come for, I, don't know, I guess, the ambience and I guess the soul of what we're about, which is, um, you know, we're really honest about everything we do. You know, we, our kitchens are incredibly open. We do really try and find the best of anything we can, whether that's food or drink. And, uh, and I think people love the fact that they're always in a busy environment, even if they're the first person in of the day. They can see their breakfast being cooked, the, the, you know, the deli cheese being cut and their coffee being made. And there is a fantastic theatre these days about going out and eating out and drinking out. And these open plan environments really play to that. Yeah, it certainly adds a more interactive feel for the customer because you can smell it and you can hear it sizzling away. So I think definitely people love that. How do you decide what goes on your menu? In terms of anything on the menu, I've got in my head and written down probably about four or five hundred dishes and recipes that I have enjoyed myself while I've been visiting Spain. And every, for the last 20 years, every, every couple of months, um, me and Elaine, my wife, we go over there uh, for a week or so and just visit farmers, producers, cafes, restaurants, bars for ideas, inspiration and products. Some of them translate perfectly to a, to a British market. Some some of them we try and tweak and adapt and I think the best example of, what, of that that we do here is our Catalan Scouse which is a, it's a British recipe, it's my mum's Scouse recipe but really enhanced by ch uh, Spanish chorizo, morcilla, pancetta, a little bit of red wine. Now I know you should never say anything's better than your mum's recipe but this is, I, I love telling her that as well, it's, it's got so much more flavour from the Spanish meats. We love meeting our customers, you know, we attract a fantastic group of people and there's nothing better than seeing people enjoy something you've made or created and we just want to do a bit of enjoyment before we do anything else. I'm still here at the Great Brick Adventure at the Exhibition Centre. Let's go inside and find out more. Ian, tell us about this structure behind us. Okay, this is uh, what you see is the start of the Big Lego Brick Hospital. Um, basically what it is, it's going to be a 500,000 brick replica of the new build hospital that Clatbridge Cancer Centre is building in the centre of Liverpool. Um, as we build it up, what we're simply asking is trying to raise half a million pounds from the project where people can give a pound and put a brick on it or raise some funding and build their own little kit, maybe a taxi or port cabin. Wow, brilliant. So ha this is a really novel way of raising money for, for the new build, isn't it? It is. It is. Most times when you have a, a big sort of a appeal, 
that we've got on at the minute, you know me have sort of a, a buy a brick campaign. Um, the design of the new hospital doesn't really have many bricks in. This is the next best thing, Lego. Um, and it's a really great way to engage with the community and sort of get them to build it really for us. Um, we're hoping the new build will be finished in about summer 2020. It'd be great if we can open, finish this at the same time. So we've got sort of two years to try and cram half a million bricks into this model. And I mean, you, you've showed me before just how big it's going to be. Could you just explain to our viewers how, how big this structure will be when it's finished? Okay, so it's uh, roughly about sort of two and a half metres wide, about 1.6 uh, in, in width. And then height wise, you're looking about 1.8 metres. What's going to happen with it once it's finished and once the hospital is finished? Okay, so we're sort of working with our design team at Clatbridge to sort of find a good suitable site for it. Fingers crossed we can get it either just on the sort of um, the heart of the green it's called which I don't know if you can tell it's sort of greenery on the design bit outside there or maybe in the foyer of the new build. Obviously you've been uh, recently nominated for an award so just tell me a bit about that. Yes basically um, we've, we've been through this process before so you, you, you first give them your um, as you say. You do an application so we last year we got the top 10 so you do an application, you get nominated, shortlist the top 60, and then we've had Mystery Shopper to get to top 20, and then top 10 last year we were top for the Northwest. So this year at the moment we've just had our Mystery Shopper, well any time till next week, so next Tuesday we'll find out if we get to top 20. And how does it make you feel to know that you've had su such success, not just this year, but in previous years as well, it's an ongoing thing? I think it symbolises that we have got good continuity, um, we're consistent with our service, our quality, um, and nearly every year since we've opened we've, we've got quite high in the competition. We've been to the finals um, a couple of times but we've, we've come home with no kiss, you know what I mean? So. Hopefully this, this yeah, time we can do with, it. started um, with Newcomer and I think it was 2011. So since then we've just grown and grown and grown. So hopefully this year might be our year. From decadent artwork to some of the best views of the free races in the entire city, we've headed to Liberté to see how they're setting themselves apart from the rest of the competition. So could you just tell us a little bit about the theming of Liberté? Because it's pretty intense and it's pretty incredible. Yeah, so obviously it's, you know, it's a very colourful, it's very bright, um, it's very decadent. Uh, basically what we're trying to produce here is just a very flamboyant and fun-filled evening. You know, whether you're coming for drinks with the girls or whether you're coming for a meal with the wife or, you know, whatever you want to choose to do while you're here you know we hope you enjoy an amazing an amazing views an amazing venue yeah you just touched on the views there as well as how incredible it looks inside outside that's gotta be a big selling point for you the view of the free graces yeah and um, we're very lucky here that you know not many places in liverpool get to boast views such as this and um, we've got it both in the main venue and also the rooftop upstairs and um, so that's you know a massive unique selling point that we've got um, but we're playing on that and everything else ties into that as well You've only been open for a short amount of time, but what has the reaction been like from the people of Liverpool and obviously people further abroad? Um, it's been amazing, to be honest with you. Um, you know, social media, things like that, has been absolutely blowing up. Um, the phone's going non-stop every day, just people trying to book tables. Um, you know, obviously it's it's a brand new venue, people want to come down, check us out, but you know, from those that have been here, we're getting great reviews on the Facebook page, and we're getting great, great feedback from the, the customers that are here, you know, on the cocktails and things like that. So it's, it's been a really great re response so far, to be honest. Hopefully we can remain here for many, many years to come, um, you know, and then looking into the future, you don't know what it holds. If it takes off, you might see us everywhere around the, around the country or even the world. You don't know. Uh, but for, for just now, we're just trying to make sure what we do, we do well and everyone leaves happy. That sounds amazing. So make sure to stay tuned to Merseyside Live as we have plenty more coming up from Liberté.